welcome to the Blue Chip DFM Roundtable. Um, my name is Ian Jones and today I'm joined by three panellists um, from the financial services industry and specifically the, the wealth and, and financial advisory industry. Um, I'm starting with Barry Mahoney. Barry is a, a certified financial planner from a business called Veritas Wealth Management. Um, a very experienced ex-financial um, planner of the year. And um, just to put a bit of context into what we're talking today, Barry and his business are a Cat1 um, advisor and they use an outsourced uh, DFM. Second is Ibrahim Muller. Um, Ibrahim is um, a senior financial advisor at uh, Bobat's Wealth Solutions. Um, and uh, Bobat's have a Cat2 business that is associated with with Bobat and uh, Ibrahim is um, central to that business. So they have their own Cat2, but they do make use of, a, of an external advisory business that helps them with parts of, of the portfolios. And then finally, uh, Dean D'Souza from Equilibrium and Momentum's uh, DFM. Um, and I think what's great today is that we have three individuals um, who who come at this topic, uh, the topic of DFMs from, from different perspectives. And I think that should lead to good discussion today. Um, so looking forward to it. Um, I mean, to kick off, uh, maybe for the audience in the room, I mean, DFM is spoken about a lot. It's been sort of probably for the last sort of seven or eight years now, been a bit of an explosion in South Africa. Discretionary fund management, also known by some as model portfolios, others call them wrap funds, lots of different names, but maybe, I mean, if we could just start with you and, say, and, and ask you to give, give your thoughts on, on what you see a DFM actually is. Uh, where do you, what do you see it is, is it in our industry? Thanks, Ian. So to me, a DFM's solutions or the services they offer, you know, are quite specialized within obviously the investment management field of the broader financial planning landscape. And, you know, in the context of our business where we had the option of choosing investments on, on behalf of our clients ourselves with this associated CAT2 business, Sterling Invest associated with Bovat, we very quickly realized that the complexity is involved within the financial planning process necessitated us to work with a specialized investments partner to do the specialized work required for putting investment solutions together. So for us, partnering with the DFM um, felt like we could focus on what we were getting paid to do as a Cat1 financial planning business and that's putting together proper financial plans, really understanding our clients' goals and objectives and helping them achieve those things. Um, and we didn't necessarily want to have to make additional investment decisions. And granted, in the 21st century that we're in, investment management has become quite sophisticated. Um, and we felt we'd rather work with an outsourced DFM partner to help us with the investment management part of what we do. So we see DFMs as an integral partner to our core business, which is proper financial planning at Bobats. Okay, maybe Dean, if you, you can come in here and just give us your thoughts on, I suppose, as a DFM, how, how would you describe what you do to others? And, and Maybe if you could specifically talk a little bit to how it differs from the traditional multi-manager or fund of fund route that, that we've seen in our industry for a long, long time. Sure. Thanks, Ian. So, look, I mean, I think the starting point is that I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all definition that, that applies to all DFMs. I think it very much depends on the value proposition that, that, a, DFM, that a DFM has. I mean, strictly speaking, as you guys know, it is... The DFM is just somebody that holds a category two license and can make changes at their discretion, you know, without relying on a client to 
call it approve that change. But I mean, I like the words that that Abraham used in, in terms of the partnering. So so for us, we really see ourselves as a DFM, and we would think most DFMs as as a partner to to advisors. And somebody can assist in enhancing that investment advice value proposition that they offer to their clients. And that can obviously come in many forms, depending on what that, that advisor's primary value proposition to his clients is. Now, I think in the case of you know traditional multi-management or fund of funds, I think that is one subset of, of a DFM offering. Um, but I think where we primarily differ is that it is more of a service rather than an off-the-shelf product for most DFMs. Yes, you can get wrapped funds that are offered or model portfolios that are offered as an off-the-shelf solution, which would in that instance be, be very similar to a traditional off-the-shelf, uh, you know, multi-managed fund of fund solution. But I think where DFMs take it a step further is, is creating a much closer relationship with that advisor, understanding his advice proposition, and then tailoring your offering to make sure that you can enhance enhance that advisor's value proposition, so that he he obviously makes you know generates the most value for for his clients, and I I think it's that that bridge between you know the financial advice world and the asset management world, which is which is a very big gap. I think DFMs play a very nice place in the middle in translating those universes between each other and creating a sort of harmonious a synergist relationship between between those two sides of the coin. Great, so I'm very bringing you in here. Happy for you to sort of add anything to that. But if the, the one thing we've noticed when talking to advisors is that there's often a mention of, well, you know, if if we get a DFM, then what are we going to do? <laughs> you know, aren't we the ones who's supposed to pick the funds? And um, your thoughts on that comments just generally on DFM? Yeah, so I that that's a mistake. Uh, and that's a, a lack of understanding of, of your value proposition to your clients, if, if a financial planner uh, thinks that. Um, I have to say, maybe 18 years ago when we started Veritas, I, I think <laughs> we, we may well have held that view. Um, I often tell people or the younger planners who come into our business now, it's kind of, you know, for the first five years, I thought I could actually time markets, knew what, you know, what the right asset managers to use were. Um, after five years, I kind of worked out that I didn't. Uh, it then took me another five years to be brave enough to actually admit to a client that actually I don't know uh, these things. Um, and when I say that, uh, hopefully I'm being modest in that. I, we were quite capable of doing it. We were doing a reasonable job. Um, but as the world became more and more complex, when, when unit trust passed out the number of stocks in the stock market, and it's now probably multiples of probably 10 or 20 times more stock, uh, unit trusts out there than there are stocks. Um, then then we felt, when like when we walk into work every morning, uh, the question I'm asking myself is, what can we do this better? And, and that's from a financial planning point of view, that's from an implementation point of view. And, and, and really, you know the the investment choices and and product choices we are are, are just a it's just a sliver uh, and one of the things that we're actually doing for our clients it's not the be all and end all very important though okay and um, Ibrahim, do you uh, just to add to i suppose the discussion so far is there anything that you can look back on when you first decided to move from sort of doing it all in house to partnering with the DFM that there was almost like an aha moment, like a moment where you went, okay, no, this is the right thing to do. That's why I'm going to do it. So I think because the decision, you know, to work with an outsourced DFM sort of dawned upon us in advance of actually, of actually doing it, I wouldn't necessarily say there was an aha moment after working with them. However, I, I must say, you know, fast forward to today, and if I look at the process that we've built out in selecting unit trusts for the various models that um, the outsourced DFM helps us put together, you know, I can say with a lot more confidence that the, de the decision making that went into selecting the fund managers, into the asset class allocation, into you know, the various investment styles incorporated into these basket of funds that we've put together. A lot of work has been done behind the scenes. And, you know, I can hand on heart say that we're putting the client 
in the best possible position from an investment perspective. Um, you know, to Barry's point earlier around, you know, the variety of different things that a 21st century financial planning business should be doing. You know, I feel we can add a lot more value on the more fluffy stuff of the relationships that, that, that we maintain with clients and rather partner with proper investment specialists who spend the entire day or it's their life's work to put together these model portfolios um, in the context of our client base and our business. Um, and it, maybe the aha moment happened when we were in the initial engagement phase with the outsourced DFM in putting together the models. You know, our business is relatively unique in that we have a, uh, a sizable Sharia compliant uh, investment book. And we needed to put together, I think at the get-go, about 12 model portfolios, you know, conventional models and Sharia models across the risk spectrum. And the amount of thinking and detail that went into structuring the mandate of those 12 models, you know, at the inception phase was probably the aha moment. There were a whole lot of things that the outsourced DFM partner raised in coming up with these mandates that we simply, you know, didn't even think about. And, you know, I, I guess post that initial setup phase, you know, we got that confidence that, you know, we've made the right decision in not necessarily completely outsourcing the investment decision. Uh, I think what's cool about having your own cat two business is we still the final trigger puller on, on what gets into the model and, um, you know, any changes that are made, but 99.9% .9 of the decisions that are used within the model portfolios that the DFM helps us, helps us to put together. It's the DFM's decision. Um, and, you know, we've got that comfort that the work has been done behind the scenes by experts in fund manager selection, asset class allocation, you know, review of macroeconomic data to understand, um, you know, which style of investment is probably best suited for the sort of medium to longer term. Um, so, you know, so we've got that comfort that we've, we've partnered with experts and in this complex um, environment that we find ourselves in where there's countless number of investment options available for clients, our outsourced DFM helps us demystify that and simplifies it into models. Um, granted, it's 12 model portfolios that we can offer, um, but chances are that if a client has a specific goal and objective uh, you know, needing to be fulfilled, overwhelming majority of those goals and objectives can be catered for within these model portfolios that we've put together. Okay, thanks. And uh, very quickly to you, um, I mean, if you can think back to when you were, had decided that you were going to partner with the DFM, can you recall what your sort of key decision factors were in deciding who to select as the DFM? Um, we, uh, well, the reason we decided to go with the DFM, first of all, was was two things were happening. One was that the kind of independent asset management businesses that we were using were becoming enormous uh, and they were starting to look like life companies and that worried us. Um, and then we had kind of gone, well, we should be looking for the next whatever, coronation or whatever asset manager that was now going to come, come through to be the next greatest thing. Um, but when you then start to look around and research, it's like, well, how do you actually find the next one? And, and it's, it clearly is a much riskier decision than choosing a, a very well-known brand name. Um, so that was on the local side. On the offshore side, um, regulation had changed and it changed to allow um, offshore managers into South Africa um, at, at a much greater scale. And we had, we had been picking up for years that we really didn't know, <laughs> I wouldn't even try, like 2% of who the asset managers were in the world. Uh, we were just, you know, it was, if they didn't have an association with South Africa. So, and they, then you just went, wow, now that's a, that's a huge, that's a huge decision. Um, so 
it was actually the offshore side that we felt more uncomfortable with. Um, and we the, the 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 local issue was more secondary, to be honest. Um, and yeah, so we engaged with one firm. We went ahead with one firm. Uh, we enjoyed it and they added a little bit of value to us. But we felt that they maybe didn't have the scale that we needed, uh, certainly excuse me, certainly internationally. Um, and then we actually made a change. We, we actually changed DFM uh, and then started, we investigated it again. Um, and actually in, in between for, for the other guys listening is, is that we actually decide, we thought about getting one of us because we have the capabilities and the experience in our business of getting one of the planners to actually be in charge of this. And that planner went, yeah, no problem. And actually, when it got to the day of actually pulling the trigger, uh, the person capitulated and went, well, actually, you know, <laughs> I, I don't want to do this. Uh, and then it was, OK, well, your job is to go and find the next uh, DFM uh, as a result of that. So that was kind of our journey in, in doing it. OK, bring Dean in here. I mean, from your guys' side, um, what do you think, if there's an advisor out there who's looking to partner with the DFM or work with the DFM, what, what specific things do you think are the core things they should be looking out for or assessing when making the decision? Thanks, Ian. So, I mean, maybe to take a step back, I think, I think a good starting point for an advisor first is to understand their own business, understand their investment advice proposition, and to understand where in that advice proposition can they do things better, to, to use Barry's words earlier. You know, there's it's a range of services that you offer. There's a range of things that you can potentially do better. And it's about understanding what in your business you would want to do better and then finding a DFM that, that can obviously match those services. Now, now, once you've ticked that box, I think a good starting point is identifying DFMs that offer the range, that range of services because the range of services offered by DFMs is very vast. You know, often some can be very complex in terms of, you know, full investment management, strategic allocation, portfolio construction, manager research. Some DFMs focus solely on manager research. Some DFMs also offer additional benefits. So, you know, such as operational reporting tools, et cetera. And so I think it's about finding which are the services that you first want to be appointing a DFM for. And I think, you know, once you've passed that hurdle, then it comes to, okay, right, now let's pick a, a credible uh, partner in doing this. And when I say credible, I think you know, it goes back to those traditional five P's of selecting an asset manager. And you first want to understand who are the people working there, what's their experience uh, in the industry, what's the depth and the breadth of their team, is it, you know, have they got a lot of experience working through different market cycles? And then want to understand their philosophy and process, you know, does it align to the philosophy that I ascribe to from a process perspective? How do they model uh, you know, asset classes, how do they construct portfolios? Do they follow a sort of more balanced fund type construction versus more specialized funds? Because you as a, an advisor might ascribe to one side or the other. Uh, performance is obviously one of the bigger ones as well um, to see, you know, in appraising the DFM, have they been successful in what they've been trying to do? And I would just, you know, caution guys to, to not just chase the best performing DFM because a lot of DFMs can purport to have the best performance but that performance comes in the context of a range of things. And so I think it's important to make sure that that performance is appraised appropriately. The performance profile is aligned to what the DFM says, because if you do appoint them, you then you can be comfortable, as, as Ibram has said, that you've been through the rigor and that the profile that you are now using for your clients is what you will get in future. Um, price is obviously, a, you know, there's a range of services that are offered. Ultimately, the client is going to pay pay that fee. And you know, of course, we do believe that clients will get a significant amount of value from that fee. But at the end of the day, it will erode client returns to a certain extent. And so you want to make sure that the fee is commensurate with, um, with the value that you're getting. And I think some more soft issues that, that come with it is things like independence. Obviously, independence is important or very important for some advisors. Others, you know, are not too too perturbed about, say, a tied DFM versus an independent DFM. So the amount of independence that, that is important to you, I think, is something that you should look for in the DFM because ultimately, you know, tied DFMs may opt to use more of their own solutions, either to boost revenue or to have trust in those, or they have trust in those solutions. And you've got to understand 
what message that comes across or how that might be perceived and whether you are comfortable with that. So I think a, a global presence is also increasingly important. Uh, as Barry had mentioned, obviously we've seen changes to Reg 28 that allows up to 45% to go offshore. And you know, given that you will need a DFM that has a, a bit of experience or, or some presence in the global space because it is a very vast environment. And you know, if roughly 30% of your assets are going to sit outside of South Africa, you'd want a DFM that can select, you know, the best opportunity set from the global space as they do in the local space. And then I think um, what's very important for us is that, you know, the DFM needs to be aligned to your investment advice and your value proposition. Um, because if they're not aligned, you're going to be constantly in fights, you're going to be constantly in arguments as to what you are trying to achieve for your clients versus what the DFM uh, is trying to offer you. So alignment to your financial advice to enhance that financial advice proposition is very important. And I think finally, the last point is really just around those operational benefits that just you know enhance the, the value proposition, things like institutional level of reporting, uh, you know, frequent communications to advisors, the ability to bulk switch investments within a model portfolio, access to restricted fees or restricted funds that DFMs have access to that you might not get, and, and potentially the tools that they can offer you to, to make your life as a financial advisor easier. I mean, you mentioned in that so the price you pay and the fees are always a, a bit of a prickly issue, but particularly when we have you know returns that are, are sort of, I suppose, fairly low. Um, so fees across the value chain have come under enormous pressure, particularly I think asset management with passives growing and international companies coming in. I mean, how does a DFM fit into the value chain? Um, I've sort of what I've seen in the market is that fees range from anywhere from low teens all the way up to 50 basis points. Um, and, and how does that fit into the value chain when you think of, as I say, the amount of pressure on fees at the moment? Um, I mean, everyone, maybe I can throw that to you. I'd be interested in all of your views, but maybe everyone, if you can kick off on that. Yeah, so, you know, historically, this DFM layer of fees wasn't there. And now all of a sudden, there's an extra layer of fees, right? So just an absolute number of of people that are in this value chain, it feels like there's a new person or a new entity that's taking a sliver of, you know, the all-in fee that the client pays. So, you know, I must admit for the discerning client or the fee sensitive client, it does become um, not necessarily an issue, but, you know, there's questions asked around the appropriateness of the fee. And when we show the benefit or the additional benefit that the client is deriving from the, the work that the DFM does and showing them the long-term value add relative to the fee, you know, it often becomes a sort of a conversation that, you know, clients sort of then buy in a lot more openly to, you know, the DFM uh, way of doing things. Um, so, you know, from, from a client perspective, you, you can understand why the media may uh, sort of frown upon, um, you know, in this whole fees must fall environment because of, you know, in a, in a low return world. But at the coal face, you know, when you're dealing with a proper client, someone who's looking for proper financial planning, Yes, it's a question that comes up, but it's never been a case of, you know, I don't want to use the DFM because I'm not willing to pay 20, 30 basis points, you know, for these services that they offer. Um, so, so, so that's my personal experience within our practice of, you know, how the conversation goes whenever we start talking about the DFM fee um, specifically. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's interesting the psychology of on a statement that there's another line uh, with with another uh, which which makes it a bigger a bigger issue. Whereas, you know, uh, the asset manager has got a performance fee that's like going into a ridiculous number, and nobody's kind of pointing at it. It doesn't create as much irritation. It's it's fascinating actually um, how that works. 
Um, I I think like one of the reasons we capitulated into using a DFM was was um, because, as I said, we were looking at the offshore side and we looked at the offshore fees that we were paying. And next minute, these guys were coming in with like an unbelievably low fee because the asset management industry in in offshore had become way more competitive. And and we have a little bit of an oligopoly, it would seem, uh, still going on here. Um, so um, so so in a way, you know, the the the, the price. Um, was actually on the offshore side in particular was brought down on the local side it still is a little bit too expensive um we would hope our, our hope was and our anticipation was when we did it uh, although it wasn't sold to us was guessing that as the dfms become more and more successful and more powerful and more influential with the asset managers they will be able to drive the price down even though the price is going to come down anyway because it's we're, we're out of sync with what's happening globally um so i don't yeah so so it's a i think that uh, the 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 price overall is i think it's fair um but but it has to it has to add value um, and one of the pr- things where it adds value is driving down the fee overall, I would see. Uh, and secondly, are you actually adding any, is it alpha or what? I don't even know which, which symbol to use in this one. Um, <laughs> okay. And then, and then finally, Dean, your, your brief comments on, on yeah. fees and, and the, the extra layer of fees and how you guys approach it with your clients. Yeah, so look, I very much concur with what, what Ibrahim has, and Barry has said. I think the first and f- first point is really are you getting value for those fees? Because you know, at the end of the day, as, as long as there's value being realized for those fees on an after fee basis, of course, uh, at, at the, in the client's hands, it's it, it's it's somewhat irrelevant because they are realizing that value. Uh, but I do think you know, to Barry's point, DFMs do play a big role in in helping drive down that overall total investment charge. And I think that's how first and foremost, the advisors should appraise it. So when you look at a, your your solution along with the DFM fee, compare that to what you would be able to achieve if you were to construct your own portfolio from the range of portfolios out there and compare it on a TIC level of what you've constructed versus what the DFM's constructed TIC plus their, their additional fees. And from, from our experience, um, and some of the solutions that, that we've constructed for clients, that overall fee, including obviously the DFM fee, along with the TICs that we've constructed, uh, or TICs of the portfolios we've constructed, those typically tend to come in within the top quartile in terms of competitiveness of fees. So, you know, although there is an additional fee line, as Barry had mentioned on the statement, that does not necessarily translate into a higher level of fees for clients because there's a lot of things that the DFMs do to push that fee down. And, and maybe one final point is that, and this is coming out of some research that, that one of our uh, consultants has done, particularly in the, in the UK space. But if you look at the trend in the UK, the, the use of DFMs has actually also allowed advisors to, to actually charge more for their financial advice proposition um, because DFMs have brought the asset manager's fees down with their own fees coming down and advisors have been able to focus on, on the advice proposition and their main value proposition being advice, and that has allowed them to actually increase their own fees. And so clients are benefiting from a, a, a better fee experience, but advisors themselves are also benefiting because they can charge more for, for their, their primary service, which is financial advice. Okay, and um, we I mean, we've you. covered a lot of the reasons why. Can I, can I maybe just jump in there? I think Sorry, Abraham, Abraham also had a point there, but do yeah. you want to go first, Abraham? Yeah, so just my experience of the different stakeholders, you know, within this um, financial advice fee charging saga, it's the asset managers that seem to be charging more than what's reasonable. So, you know, in my opinion, the financial advice fee should be the highest as a percentage of total, followed arguably by the DFM fee. And thirdly, you know, the asset manager fee 
you know, feels like it should be sort of in line with the DFM fee. And then obviously you've got the, the platform fee, um, you know, last. So just in this hierarchy or in this, in this value chain, um, I feel the DFM fees being charged are reasonable relative to the value that you're getting. Whereas the average asset manager fee, especially in SA, feels way too high. And part of the reason why we want to work with um, a DFM partner is firstly, the DFM partner sort of subscribes to the same view as ours that asset manager fees, uh, fees, asset manager fees need to fall. And secondly, they fighting the good fight on our behalf with these asset managers to reduce their fee. Um, because as I mentioned, in my experience, the asset manager fee relative to value does feel excessive. And the, and the value, I mean, the, the reason that the, the financial planner fee is higher is because a financial planner is very limited in the amount of clients that they can actually deal with. Um, so, so that's... That's the reason. If anyone is wondering why why Abraham is saying that, so very importantly is, and somebody mentioned it earlier on, is it frees up by using a research house that are. So a couple of things happen when we went to presentations from the asset managers. We were receivers of information. We were one of if we were lucky, 12 people in a room, but we were the receivers of a presentation. We we weren't investigating what was actually going on. And if there was, and of course, nobody brings out their dirty washing uh, in a public space, um, uh, unless it was really bad. And um, so, so now we have people who are ahead of the game and are, have got that information for us um, much earlier. But the other real benefit and somebody has mentioned this before which is to reiterate it it frees us up it frees us up to spend more time with our clients more quality time with our clients doing more stuff on the financial planning area because i think that that is where the value can be added and it will make more of an economic and uh, um, a kind of a human um, uh, difference to our clients um, and, and, and then you end up running a much better business and your clients are much happier in the end. So there is a, there is a benefit. It, it seems, you know, it seems counterintuitive. You know, we put in another layer, there's another cost, there's another person involved here. Surely this is a really bad idea. But actually, if the price can come down, if the, if the value add can come through, um, everybody should win in the end. And most importantly, but the client wins in the end and gets a better service uh, through, through their financial planner as a, as a result. Thanks, Barry. Uh, I mean, we've sp spoken, I suppose, collectively, three of you, about a lot of the reasons why having a DFM is a good idea. And perhaps the one, I suppose, reason it's a bad idea is that you have to pay a fee for it. It's not free. <laughs> but any other thoughts on other downsides of using a DFM as opposed to doing it yourself? Um, Dean, I'm not going to put you in a position to answer this question. It's probably a difficult <laughs> one for you to answer. But Ibrahim or Barry, any, any other thing that you look at and you say, that's something you've got to get over or, as, as an advisor or it's a downside to having it? Um, I mean... Uh, one is 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 it depends on how much you see yourself as an investment advisor rather than a, a financial planner. So so we're quite comfortable in the space. Um, we we as a business, um, you know, I mean, my career just very briefly was when I came here first. I was uh, in share portfolio management in 1993, and I did that for five years, and that was a reasonably ugly experience trying to defend uh, very below below par. Uh, performance and it, only at that point were were the the Seifritz, the Investex, the Alan Grays were starting to come to the fore in the unit trust industry. I mean, Lisp barely didn't even exist. I, I don't think at, at that point. So, um, so that that was the first progression. And then I, I worked for a, a Manco and and a startup Manco, which was quite interesting to try and make some space in between all of these bigger names or we were. You know, we were very talented asset managers as competitors, and then uh, and then I went into uh, that business transformed into a multi manager, um, and then I set up 
I went off and uh, and set up uh, Veritas. So we we have always been comfortable in a multi managed space. Um, it'll be interesting in time. So what is the downside? One of the downsides is CGT. Um, you know, switches are. Um, the the other is which my fear is is you know do do the DFMs feel under pressure to make a change. Uh, to, to constantly make changes to show that they're actually doing something. Whereas, like in, uh, don't ask me to bake a cake, but apparently if you open up the oven, you're going to ruin the cake. So um, you can interfere a little bit too much. Um, and uh, that that is one of my fears that we end up in this overly complex thing that actually achieves very little. And in the end, you know, the, the, the FM is 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 a phase. Like in 1998, 99, 2000, it was about rack funds, and then it went into multi management, and then it went back onto platforms and and using balance funds, and then it became share portfolios, and now it's DFMs, and apparently share people are still doing share portfolios, which, you know, good luck with that one. Um, so. Um, and I say that with respect. It's just my experience of it that was pretty bad. Um, so, yeah. So, and 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 the other thing that I think advisors need to be aware of is is everyone's trying to set themselves out to be different. I don't think you should set yourself out to be different on an investment. You know, on investments. The second thing is people are trying to drive the costs down, and that's why share portfolios came back into play. And that's why passive is in play. Is is and and is that in all honesty just creating space for your advice fee? Um, and yeah, so 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 I think you know a bit of humility and try not to look too clever um, and and too cheap. Right. Anything to add, Abra? Um Yeah. So why not work with a DFM? Um, I would think, you know, it's very specific to the value proposition that you've advertised to your client base. It's probably the biggest factor in deciding whether to work with a DFM or not. Um, as Barry mentioned, if you purport to be an investment specialist and, you know, wanting to be involved in the investment decision on behalf of your clients, then maybe to a certain extent, working with an, a completely outsourced DFM is not a good idea. But then I look at what we've done. We set out within the industry wanting to be inherently involved in the investment decision, but we felt within the model portfolio space where you know there's a certain skill set of choosing fund managers, asset class allocation, doing rebalancing, reporting on these model portfolios, we felt that was, that was an overly specific skill set that we weren't necessarily comfortable um, making or, or decisions, uh, a group of decisions that we were making on behalf of our clients. So we focus our investment management capabilities on the stock picking side. We feel that's where our partner Cat2 business can develop its process and add value. And on the model portfolio side, which is a very different skill set to individual stock picking, we felt working with a third party uh, outsourced DFM um, you know, is the better solution. So it comes back down to that value proposition, um, what you're purporting to be to your clients. It comes down to um, you know, what you deem necessary or important in how you want to spend your day adding value to, to your clients. I know Barry made the point earlier around you have a limited amount of time during the day. The, the nature of a financial planning business is it's not that scalable, right? You can only service a very specific number of clients. And if you look at all best financial planning practices today, it's about truly understanding your clients, you know, engaging with them in meaningful ways to add value to their long-term goals, add value to helping them achieve their long-term goals and ambitions. And yes, a part of it is making sure they invested into the right things. However, that's not 
the primary reason we engaging with these clients. That's the, that's not the core thing that we're doing within proper proper financial planning. Um, and if there's anything sort of non-core, you know, we're big believers in working with partners who can do it better than us. You're acting in the client's best interest at the end of the day. Yeah, and just a, one other point there, Ian, is, um, you know, by using a DFM, it's not the it's not the panacea. You haven't solved all of your investment problems. Um, you, you're you know you have you are just using something that's better. It's it's, it's a better implementation. It's better researched um, than it has been uh, in the past. Um, and and going into the future, uh, you, you know, you can't expect it that it's now going to massively outperform everybody else. But it does have to wash its face. It does have to cover the fees that 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 are there. Um, so so that's that's our hope for it in in the long term. And that's as an independent, that's what we're watching and keeping an eye on uh, on behalf of our clients. Right. Thanks. Yeah, and I totally agree with Barry's point regarding the DFM solution basically, basically being an implementation of, of investment views, right? It, I don't necessarily want to say it's the flavor of the month, but right now, based on all the tools and options available to the independent financial advisor, it does feel like the DFM solution makes the most sense for our practice. It could be that a multi-manager solution or you choosing your own funds, you know, works best for you. But right now for us, it does feel like the DFM solution um, makes the most sense. Um, Dean, to bring you in, um, one of the things that has been, I suppose, bandied about a little bit, and I think this comes from primarily asset managers who, who feel potentially a little bit disintermediated is this thought that DFMs are, might be compromising the independence of an independent financial advisor. So, you know, tied advisors to use the in-house DFM in a business, that's, that's a different story. But for an independent financial advisor to work with a DFM, um, what do you make of, of comments around it impinging on their, on their independence? Yeah, so thanks, Ian. I mean, I would actually argue the, the opposite of that. So I would say that DFMs actually allow advisors to, to potentially be more independent. And the reason I'd say that is given their level of expertise, the breadth of coverage, the depth of coverage, you know, I think DFMs have the ability to appraise asset managers potentially more objectively because that is the expertise. That's what they're being paid to do. And so, you know, they're willing to put in the hard work to find the most appropriate asset manager or fund for the solution. Whereas I think from a financial advisor's side, you know, given the comments from Barry and Ibrahim, time is is relatively limited in your day and your your, your main skill should be the financial advice. So often you might find advisors who defer to say, you know, the largest four balance funds because that's that's the solution that's going to give them, you know, the least hassles or the least headaches. And irrespective of how those guys perform or the value that they add, money will continue to flow to them. So I think the DFM can assist in making it more independent. But again, I'll come back to my earlier comments is that, you know, if independence is something that, that an advisor themselves particularly strives for, then that should be you know, made very apparent when you select your DFM. So, you know, if you find a DFM who's potentially tied to a uh, a life office or their own, you know, manco or or their own advice firm, for example, um, you should interrogate them and, and and understand whether that link or that tied uh, nature is going to influence. Uh, what they will use in their solutions and how much of that they will use in their solutions. Because at the end of the day, there will be a commercial argument for it for the DFM if they are tied to somewhere. And, and that commercial side may, you know, impinge on the on the overall solution. And you need to understand from the outset to what extent that will be the case and, and whether you are comfortable with it. And, you know, in, in certain instances, and I'll speak for ourselves here, 
you know, there are certain solutions or funds that we have access to as, as equilibrium, you know, being tied to momentum that aren't offered to, to the greater industry. And we think those give us an edge within our solutions. Um, and so I think sometimes that, that tied nature can work to the advantage of the, of the clients, but, but you and as advisor obviously needs to make sure that that's not to the detriment of your clients. It should always be to the benefit of your client. And, and of course, always strive to, to interrogate that independence and make sure that anything that makes its way into your client solutions is there on merit rather than for a commercial or a branding reason. Um, Barry, are you room, anything to add from the independence uh, side? I think the independence only come, well, I mean, they're, they'd be pretty rare, I would think. I, I don't think independence is a, is a big issue. Um, I think... I think most DFMs are smart enough to know, um, even even the ones that are part of big organizations, that you know if they start overusing uh, their own funds, they're I mean it's, they're going to blow themselves out of the water. Um, I think um, as long as the uh, uh, the DFM has doesn't have a stake in a business. Uh, would 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 be you know that that obviously and then it's influencing what advisors within the business can can or, you know where they have to place uh, the funds. Um, so I don't think that that's a big issue. But but my real point here is it's it's still the advisors has to go back to my point of you have to continually reassess. Am I have I made the right decision? Should I be using multi management? Should I be using a share portfolio? Should I be using uh, property trusts should I be using um, uh, passive balance funds, uh, and and should I be using this DFM? I mean, are, are, does it all add up, or am I actually falling behind here? And if the answer is I'm falling behind, then you you stand up and you 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 address it, and and you may have to make a change. Um, I, I've just got something to add in. So, totally agree with Barry's point around. I'm at the call face with the client and ultimately I was responsible for the performance of the investment, regardless of what solution we chose to go with, whether that's share portfolios, multi-manager model portfolios. And from an independence perspective, as long as I feel internally or as a financial planning business, we are remaining independent. And when we've, sort of selected the outsourced DFM partner. We've done our checks and balances to make sure that they are independent. And as long as I've got the option to fire my DFM at any point, um, I feel like independence is, is not an issue at all, um, as long as those three, those three steps um, have been followed. And so and maybe if I can make just, just one final comment as well in terms of the independence is that I, I would also implore the advisor to look look deeper in terms of independence than, than purely just what, what the name suggests, because, uh, you know, to various points, it's a very smart industry. And there's, there's a lot of ways that a, a, a solution that may be perceived as completely independent is actually not so independent, you know, either through sort of other types of companies or, or mancos or platforms or whatever the case may be. And so I think when you, when you are looking for independence and if that's something to import, important for you look deeper than just you know if it's an equilibrium solution is it packed with just equilibrium funds because there could be other areas where it's it's perceived to be independent when that's actually not necessarily the case okay great i think i think to close off would be great is if each of you could just think of if, if you were talking to an independent financial advisor that was was not currently using a DFM, but was considering one and, and, and thinking about using one. And you had to give them one piece of advice, one thing to think about in, in their search. What would that one sort of quick take be? And Dean, I'll, I'll stay with you and then, and then go to others. Sure, thanks. And so, I mean, for me, I think if you, are, if you are thinking of using a DFM, my parting advice would be to just set up a meeting with one. Preferably equilibrium if you can, but uh, um, but yeah, I, I would say set up a meeting with with a DFM. Of course, coming back to my earlier comments, understand your value proposition first and foremost. Know where it is in your business you can improve. But then I think the easiest way to to help you get over that line 
is to set up a meeting with the DFM, understand the DFM offering uh, better, and maybe set up meetings with a few DFMs, because that will highlight to you whether a DFM will add value to your practice. And then beyond that, which of the DFMs would add the most value to your practice? And, and maybe one final part in comment, sorry, Ian, is that consider the, I think the regulatory you know, burden that's potentially on the horizon. So, I mean, a lot of advisors will be aware of RDR, which seems to have been coming in for the last five, 10, 20 years. But I think the regulatory burden is is becoming increasingly complex. And, you know, if you're aware of that's on the horizon and you can find a way to, to make your life a lot easier by partnering with the DFM, you should definitely consider doing so. And Ibrahim, your, your one nuggets of advice. So my parting advice for someone looking to work with the DFM, ideally, it needs to make sense for you as a practice. Um, for us and our journey, you know, initially we started out wanting to do the investment management and investment uh, administration in-house. However, we felt we'd much rather spend that time doing the investment administration, investment management, all the work that the, the, the DFM partner, outsourced DFM partner now does for us. We'd much rather spend that time with clients and helping them fulfill their goals and objectives. And the, the decision to work with the DFM, um, you know, we made about four years ago, three years ago, you know, we, we haven't looked back. And, and to me, based on the scale of our business, maybe that's something else worth mentioning. I do feel, you know, once you're at a certain scale and potentially looking to grow, um, you need more time in the day to, to meet with more clients. Maybe that's um, a good time, you know, to consider working with an outsourced DFM. Um, back to the point I made earlier around, if I look back at the impact working with the outsourced DFM has had on our practice, you know, I'm, I'm feeling totally justified in, in, in pulling that trigger and, and, and working with an outsourced DFM. And to me, it feels like in 2023, um, it's naturally the right thing to do um, based on the complexity of the work that we do. Great. And um, Barry, to, to close things up. Yeah, I, I think the overarching thing that business owners uh, and financial planners need to really focus on is you, your job is to be sitting in front of clients and giving advice. That's it. That, that's your job. And you need to free up as much time as you possibly can. So in our business, to give you some of the ridiculous things, we outsource marketing, uh, we outsource accounting, we outsource compliance. They do not sit in our office. Um, we, we, we free up our, our, our time in doing that. If you can free up your time without completely, you're not abdicating this thing. You're, you're, you're just, you know, you're, you're, you're just building a, a better process, building a, a, a deeply researched and properly implemented um, implementation part of our business. But that's really what, what, what we're looking for. And, and to give you one example, which hasn't actually come up, is if we decide to switch out of a fund and everyone in our client base had that fund, who do we start with? Our A client, and so we're a cat one, I'm saying this as, as a cat one, who do we start with? Uh, the biggest clients, the smallest clients, the A people whose alphabet is starts with A, or because that is going to take us if we're really, really committed to it and do nothing else except switch all our clients out, it will take us in our business probably two months solidly reviewing that with our clients and, and doing those switches. That that is ridiculous. That is not a value add, and I don't believe it. it we would only do it if, if 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 we thought it was serious anyway. But I don't think it adds that much value uh, to the whole thing. So it it could be two months, or it could be two years by the time we actually get to all of our clients and get them out of that particular fund. So there are. Um, that's not a reason to use a DFM, but it is one of the benefits uh, of use of using them. 
Great. I mean, I think we, we can leave it there. I mean, a big thank you to, to all three of you on the panel uh, for the discussion. Um, hope everyone found it useful. And um, that's it from the Blue Chip DFM Roundtable. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Tim.